first of all, thanks to the organizers for uh, inviting me and uh, uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, get my work out to a, to a more general audience. And uh, fortunately, Steve has already uh, made some considerations that I'm gonna piggyback on a little bit. Uh, in particular, uh, I'm gonna take a, a complementary approach to the um, to the string models that uh, he he's presented, and more generally to this uh, more UV-like uh, uh, approach. So the this talk is based on on these three papers that I wrote um, together with uh, with Augusto, who is my supervisor and uh, our collaborator uh, Giad Murad from Paris. And these two uh, other papers are written with uh, uh, my two colleagues, uh, Riccardo Antonelli, who's a PhD student uh, in Scuola Normale, and uh, Alessandro Bombini, who was uh, formerly in Padua. So as I anticipated, my approach here is um, a bit complementary to Steve's, uh, since we are going to use mostly low energy effectivity theories of non-supersymmetric string models. Uh, but nonetheless, even though uh, there are these uh, arguments that uh, no matter how long you stare at uh, low energy theory, you're never gonna get to the UV, we did manage to uh, get some hints of what the UV behavior of, of these models uh, is. And of course, we're, we're not really cheating because we do have some information from the UV because we are starting from top down swing so models even though uh, we're working within the effective framework. And, uh, and also I'm gonna uh, touch on, uh, I mean, on, on, uh, on issues related to the question about landscapes that was uh, asked. Uh, since I am gonna talk about landscapes, but they are toy landscapes, if you will. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's essentially a family of ADS compactification compactifications with, uh, with a single flux. So even though it is a single, it is a, it's a toy landscape, there is still some uh, interesting, interesting lessons to be learned from, uh, from that, I believe. And, um, and in this whole analysis, which rests essentially on, on the instabilities of these landscapes that are not, sub, uh, not protected by supersymmetry anymore, uh, in passing, we, we also managed to connect our results to this uh, Zwompland program, since we, we, we managed to derive some of the constraints that have been proposed uh, in, in the past uh, within this context. And uh, yeah, so let me first start with a few motivations, even though Steve was pretty clear about that. Uh, so what's this uh, whole ordeal about uh, non-supersymmetric strings? I mean, uh, why are we doing this? Well, the, the, the key points from a theoretical perspective are that the issue of low scale supersymmetry breaking is that there is no real deep principle as of yet. So essentially there are many mechanisms that have been proposed, many types of, um, of landscapes that result from, uh, from that, but there is no real guiding principle. And moreover, even if we were to, to, to take seriously one of uh, these possibilities, uh, the resulting physics is really hard to control when SUS is broken. Even when it seems like it is under control, there are some controversies about back reactions and, uh, and instabilities and the like. So if I were to attempt to translate this uh, into a more phenomenological language, what I would say is that we do have this uh, wide uh, range of possibilities uh, that we do not know how to select. And uh, the problem is that even if we were to select one of these possibilities, making predictions is hard. Making controlled predictions is hard. And, and, and this is where the landscape idea comes from, essentially. The idea that instead of predicting hard numbers, uh, one can instead make predictions excluding what cannot be observed, essentially. Um, so the, instead, our approach to, to start with non-supersymmetric models, or if you will, from high-scale supersymmetry breaking, from st st string-scale supersymmetry breaking, is 
to essentially metaphorically use the enemy's strength against them. So to use the fact that when Susi is broken, instabilities arise all over the place to generate interesting, dynam interesting dynamics and interesting phenomenology from, uh, from them. Instead of looking at the instabilities and throw everything out the window, uh, we, we are seeking to learn what these instabilities can tell us. Um, and to, in order to do this, of course, one of the uh, most uh, relevant models that I'm going to talk about is the uh, SO16 times SO16 heterotic string that uh, Steve described. But I am also going to include some orientifold models. And in order to build them, and, and, and also some generalizations that are going to arise uh, in these landscapes, uh, we need some basic string ingredients, uh, which are mostly D brains and O planes. Uh, so D brains uh, are, uh, I mean, the, the key difference between uh, these objects is that even though they are both extended objects, higher dimensional extended objects that can also get uh, to fill the whole space time, of course, the key differences are that while D brains are dynamical and can move and wiggle around and carry degrees of freedom on their work volume, and generally speaking, the low energy effective theories on their work volume looks like a gauge theory, essentially, coupled to the bulk gravitational sector. And they have positive tensions, and as uh, one can intuitively um, conceive, the orientable planes are fixed localized sources that still couple to the bulk gravitational sector, uh, but, uh, but their, um, their tension can be also negative. This is a key crucial difference that is able to reproduce supersymmetric string models when you put together D brains and O planes whose tensions cancel out, uh, but in our cases, these tensions are going to adapt and provide uh, essentially the uh, low energy manifestation of supersymmetry breaking here. So with, with these ingredients, uh, one can build uh, uh, the one can build a variety of supersymmetric string models. But here we focus on these three, which are ten dimensional uh, strings with no tokens. So the first one, again, is the uh, non-supersymmetric heterotic string. Uh, but the two orientifold models that I anticipated are, um, so are orientifolds of the type to be string, which is supersymmetric, and so the orientifold projection breaks SUSY, while the other uh, orientifold model is a non-tachyonic orientifold of the non-supersymmetric tachyonic 0B model. And they carry um, large gauge groups, namely uh, a symplectic and a unitary gauge group. So these gauge groups uh, are carried by uh, nine dimensional brains, so they fill the whole 10 dimensional space time, whereas the SO16 times SO16 gauge group of the heterotic model is, is uh, carried by the closed string themselves. They are charged under uh, this, uh, this gauge group. Instead, in the oriental case, the extrema of open strings, the endpoints, are charged. So for what concerns us at the uh, low energy level, the manifestation of the, this uh, breaking is that either in the heterotic model there is this uh, string scale cosmological constant that arises from the one loop um, torus uh, amplitude, or in the oriental cases, um, there is this um, there is this residual tension in, in space time that comes from putting nine brains and nine uh, oriental planes in in vacuum, and so both of these um, energy densities coupled to the gravitational sector, in particular to dilaton, which is this universal scalar that comes about in in string models, and uh, and so the low energy description which we are going to consider is essentially your run-of-the-mill effective field theory of string models plus this effective potential that is 
uh, always uh, exponential in the dilaton. And um, so the uh, smoking gun that it, this is a this is a low energy uh, effective field theory of string models is that there is this uh, exponential coupling to a form field which is in, in this case a three form and depending on which string theory we're talking about it's either a Ramon Ramon field or a Neuschwartz uh, Neu Schwartz field but the the important point is that we can use this effective field theory to build some perturbative landscapes and so there are a number of solutions that can be that can be found, but the, the simplest ones are these uh, Freund-Rubin compactifications that look like ADS times an internal space, which we take uh, as the sphere in this example. And so you see, you can thread the spheres uh, with uh, with fluxes that can be either electric or magnetic, and depending on the model, only one of these fluxes can be uh, turned on. And so at the end of the day, there is an ADS three times a seven with electric flux in the oriented case, and that's it. Or an, an ADS seven times S3 um, with magnetic flux in the adriatic case, and that's it. And the key feature of both types of landscapes is that for large fluxes, uh, both types of string corrections are uh, parametrically suppressed. So, uh, barring some uh, subtle uh, considerations about the validity of this effective action, we can expect that these solutions are under control, even though they are unstable in various ways, as we shall see. But first, let me present concretely the solutions to, 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 to see that, I mean, there are some weird numbers uh, going around, but the, the important point is the sign of these numbers. So, um, so the, the, what matters in, the, in these solutions is the value of the string coupling, which is e to the phi, which is constant, uh, and the curvature ADI of the ADS and sphere factors. And they all scale like powers of the flux, not, not particularly nice powers, as in these supersymmetric cases, but powers nonetheless, and positive powers in the case of curvature ADI, and negative powers in the case of the string coupling, which means that for large fluxes, corrections are indeed uh, expected to be suppressed. And moreover, one more reason why these landscapes are kind of toy landscapes is that there is no scale separation. The, the two factors are of uh, comparable curvature. In the theoretic case, it's basically more of the same. There is a... Um, I mean, there are some differences in the actual uh, values of the numbers, but the key features are the same, apart from the difference that this uh, potential here comes from the one loop torus amplitude, which is essentially the modular integral that was presented in the preceding talk. Uh, but instead, we, we are computing it into the full, in the full uh, SO16 times SO16 regime, where it's a number of order one over alpha prime. So one way may wonder uh, at the outset, how come uh, how it is possible that we can manage to suppress corrections since this effective potential is one over alpha prime with respect to the other factors? But that's why the fluxes save the day because they introduce a new scale which is parametrically separated from alpha prime. So now that we have uh, presented the actual uh, landscapes at hand. Let me talk about instabilities. So there are two types of instabilities uh, in this context, and they are perturbative or classical, which deal with, um, which come from uh, field fluctuations, or non-perturbative or quantum, if you will, because they come from tunneling effects, from instantons. So in the case of perturbative instabilities, uh, the criterion is a little bit different from the usual uh, flat space case, instead of requiring that squared masses be non-negative, the correct requirement is a little bit relaxed because there is a contribution to the effective mass that comes from the ADS curvature. And, and so at the end of the day, so this is the celebrated uh, Bretelon and Friedman bound in the case of a free scalar. One sees that the squared masses have to be greater than or equal to a negative number which is 
relaxed with respect to the uh, flat space case. And this is the criterion that we uh, have used. Of course, it's generalizations um, since we are dealing with tensor and vector and scalar field modes, which have also some mixings. So performing the linearized analysis of this vacua uh, and expanding all the various perturbations in, uh, in angular momenta with respect to the internal sphere, um, we found that there is uh, a, a finite number of unstable uh, calzaglime modes, uh, which is, um, well, which you can see here. So in the iterative case, only the uh, L equals one mode in the scalar sector is unstable, whereas in the hydrotic models, these three values of the angular momentum uh, correspond to unstable modes in the scalar sector. The tensor and vector um, sectors are actually not unstable. And this is for the ADS uh, solutions, but as I briefly mentioned, there are other uh, vacua that uh, one can study, even though they, con they contain regions where corrections are large, either due to curvature or to uh, the dilaton getting large. Uh, but most interestingly for uh, the purposes of, of this talk, which is supposed to be on the phenomenological side, is that there is a 10-dimensional cosmology, which is controlled apart from the uh, Big Bang singularity, where there is just this uh, instability in the homogeneous tensor mode of the metric which suggests, if you will, a tendency toward spontaneous compactification. So there are some preliminary hints of a selection mechanism, which is again killing two birds with one stone. So you break Susie, which you do not want, uh, and you do get uh, a selection principle. Of course, this is still very preliminary, but still it is an interesting result, I believe. So now let me get to the story of non-perturbative instabilities. Of course, if anybody has any questions up to now, feel free to interrupt me at any moment. Um, so as far as non-perturbative instabilities go, we are still in the um, control regime. If we manage to get rid of the perturbative instabilities, which in principle can be done with the suitable or defaults of the sphere in, or choosing a different internal space. And, uh, and then one is left with non-perturbative instabilities, which are definitely there and uh, can be analyzed with um, instanton calculus, right? And so what happens is that we, we have a single flux landscape, right? So it is a trajectory in this uh, schematic picture here. And what happens is that these tunneling processes lower the flux. And so it, it drags us along one of these trajectories toward a strong coupling region in, uh, in, in this landscape. And, and so without supersymmetry and without global knowledge of, of what the landscape looks like, how do we deal with this? I mean, how do we understand what's at the end? And, and this is where the stringy considerations comes in and where the B brains uh, come, come in. So first of all, let, let's start from the weakly coupled region, right? So let, let's see what happens. What happens is this process uh, term flux tunneling, which is essentially a generalization of the brown tetelbaum process to suppress the cosmological constant in four dimensions. And what happens is that bubbles of the same charge that is carried by the ADS nucleate inside the ADS and then expand and they carry away the flux. This is because essentially the vacuum energy depends on the flux, which is the only parameter in the game, in such a way that the energy is lowered when the flux is lowered, right? So what, what one gets is processes that look like this. And there are arguments to suggest that small steps are dominant in this sense. So we, we are justified in using the thin wall approximation when computing the, the instant on, uh, that, uh, that mediates, mediates this process. And that's exactly what we did. And then we also matched this uh, decay rate that comes from, uh, from an instanton with the Euclidean action of a brain instanton. 
and this is because this is where the stringy considerations come in. So essentially, we we observe that these bubbles carry both the same charge and the correct dimensions to be fundamental brains, which are either D1 brains in the identical models or Neverschwartz five brains in the heterotic model. So this is a preliminary uh, hint that fundamental brains and stringy effects play a role here because the actions do match in, in form. So there is an area term with a tension and a volume term with a charge. But what we did uh, uh, to, to proceed is to, 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 to derive some more, uh, some constraints on what these brains look like. So to, in order to do that, first of all, we computed the full uh, decay rate, which, which is an ugly function, but it only depends basically on this parameter here. So the, this whole decay business rests on whether this parameter beta is larger than one. That's all we need. And moreover, in order for the uh, decay to be semi-classical, in order for things to be consistent, it needs not to scale with the flux, which again, is the only parameter. So if it doesn't scale with the flux, it's basically just a number, which depends on the charge to tension ratio of this brain. And, uh, and this condition actually translates into a requirement on how the brain tension scales with the string coupling in a background independent fashion. And it turns out that this requirement is precisely the scaling of uh, fundamental brain tensions, which is uh, a very uh, intriguing result because it, it's, it's a bit like seeing into the UV from the IR, from, from consistency as such. So at the end of the day, this parameter here is basically a number V naught times the charge to, to tension ratio, which in the case of the fundamental brains at hand is just one. So it's a number, it's V naught. And the key point is that this V naught number is, is either larger or uh, larger than one or is not, and it only depends on the model. And it turns out that the, in these models, it is larger than one. So first of all, the decay occurs and is consistent, but also uh, the subsequent expansion of the bubble is, uh, corresponds correctly to, to the interaction between brains. So these brains are repelled to each other instead of having a no force property. So, so let, me, let me reiterate because this is important. In, in the supersymmetric case, if you put brains parallel to each other with, with the same charge, they just um, don't do anything. Therefore, they, they feel no force because they are BPS objects, mutually BPS objects. In this case, even though they are by themselves, they interact through a background which is not supersymmetric. And this effect renormalizes this charge to tension ratio in the correct direction. It increases the, this ratio, which is consistent with the weak gravity conjecture. And, and that, this is how we derive some uh, swampland uh, criteria. So we derived the existence of instabilities, but also that the weak gravity conjecture must hold in these models. Ivano, sorry, yes. you have about five minutes, okay? Sure. So I, I'm almost done, actually. So, uh, so to, to get further than that, the, what I told you is these brains interact, but how did I do that? I mean, it seems like I just put a brain in ADS and, and, and so what happened. But actually, we can do better than that. We can show, or at least suggest, that e these ADS geometries are actually made up of these brains, much like in this specific case. And uh, we did this studying the most general solution to the uh, low energy theory with this type of symmetry. And uh, it turns out that there is this uh, near horizon limit that looks like the ADS times S. Um, solution, which is typical of extremal black objects. And what is typical is in general the fact that once you go away from the throw, the space opens up into a, an asymptotically, let's say, maximally symmetric infinity. In this case, this doesn't happen because this asymptotic solution is not there. It's simply not there because of the exponential potential. And what happens is that space closes off at a finite distance, 
in a curvature singularity, which we cannot really say anything, of course, but, but there must be some, some capping effects. And moreover, this, this is a full uh, family of solutions from the point of view of the gravity theory that actually reproduces as a special case a previously known solution, which is this uh, nine-dimensional static solution. So it, it, it seems like there is uh, much support for this, uh, for this idea of brains making up ADS and then uh, repelling each other. And, um, and this is where the instability comes from, from, from a single perspective. And so the intuition is that the end point of this process, the end point of this trajectory in the landscape, is just a single brain that remains by itself. Uh, and this is where now, finally, um, we come to the phenomenology. So how do we use concretely these instabilities to build some interesting phenomenology? And the key observation was uh, revisited recently in a series of papers by the Uppsala group, which propose a mechanism to realize a de Sitter cosmology on one of these brains that expand in ADS. Um, so what happens, is, I mean, this is a, an actual string realization of, of this type of scenario if everything that I said holds up. And, um, and it's very interesting because we do know what the, the degrees of freedom on these, of the, on these brains look like, and it's essentially a gauge theory, right? And uh, it's a gauge theory that is supposed to capture holographically the quantum gravity behavior of, of this uh, whole uh, setup. So we, we are supposed to have, at least in principle, some hold on the quantum correction, uh, quantum corrections of, of this uh, picture. But again, let, let me reiterate, we have a way to generate the sitter solutions because an observer that lives on the brain sees a desitter cosmology. And uh, the, the interesting uh, numerical um, part of it is that, say, in the example of the SO16 hydratic model, we put NS5 brains, they repel, they expand, they um, produce the sitter vacua on, on their world volume. And if you put a large number of them, the resulting cosmological constant in this desitter 6 is parametrically small. So it's, it's nice to see that in the regime where the ADS is reliable, also the, the sitter is. So this is basically the, the end. So the, this is a hopefully nice looking picture that summarizes what I, what I said. And, but the, the key take home message here is that these non-spersymmetric uh, ADS vacuum in this case are unstable, of course, and, but, but we used these instabilities to get some possibly interesting uh, phenomenology or at least toy models of phenomenology. So w if you are to take just a single sentence from this talk, this is what I want you to take home. So the idea that breaking supersymmetry, instead of looking at it like it leads to bad instabilities, you can look at it as it leads to interesting dynamics in a, in a spontaneous way. There is no uh, freedom, essentially. At least it, that's what it looks like. So at the end of the day, if all of this holds up, and of course we're investigating various leads from here, it may be true that we are actually killing two birds with one stone. And uh, I'm done. Thank you very much for okay. listening. Thank you, Ivano. So, questions? Yes. Just time for some questions. I can maybe start again with a naive question. So, essentially, you are describing your one flux landscape of anti resistor solutions on which brains can be the sitter. And I guess that across the landscape, the effective cosmological constant on the brain will be different. So it will actually be a landscape, right? Yes. Now, these, and these anti sitter solutions, they have a discharge phenomenon, right? You can nucleate and basically change the flux. And change so this looks very similar to Abbott solutions to the cosmological constant, right? Because effectively it's the same thing. Now, there, there was the problem of the empty universe, that you were actually, you know, uh, tunneling from one vacuum to the other one, and you were lowering the cosmological constant, you were slowing down when you were going to a small cosmological constant, but you end up with an 
empty universe, basically, because you had a, a long inflation <coughs> before, long decitor expansion before. Does the same happen here or not? Well, in this case, um, during this process, the cosmological constant actually goes up, right? Because it, it's one over n squared for large n, and n goes down. Okay. Uh, and, so, and so essentially the, what matters is the beginning of, of this whole uh, eternal inflation thing. Because okay, you get... so it's basically, yeah, okay, it's essentially the opposite of Abbott's solution. Okay, thanks. Pretty much. So, more questions? Well, it seems not, so thank you, Ivano, and thanks, thanks everyone. Thank you very much for having me. So, um, again, I would like to remind you